connecting research communities in, high, in computing architectures and compilations in Europe uh, through the HIPEC uh, network. He's co-authored more than 200 publications and has been an editor-in-chief of the uh, ACM Transactions on Architecture and Code Optimization. His talk is titled, HIPEC, 17 Years of Growing an HPC Community in Europe. Please take it away. Good morning. Um, thanks for the introduction. My name is Koen de Botre. I'm the coordinator of the HIPEC Network and also a professor at Ghent University. Uh, today I'm going to introduce you to HIPEC and the back office of HIPEC and what it takes uh, to grow an HPC community in Europe. We started 17 years ago, uh, precisely in 2004, with HIPEC 1, which was uh, a networking instrument called a network of excellence. And we got three networks of excellence in a row. After that, we continued as a coordination and support action, which is another funding uh, instrument by the European Commission. Today, we are in the middle of HIPEC 6, which is um, well running for another one and a half year. And actually, last month, I have submitted a proposal for a HIPEC 7 because we want to continue HIPEC in the future uh, too. So it's a project. So that means that we have partners. And here you see an overview of the 12 partners who are involved in HIPEAC uh, 6. HIPEAC stands for High Performance Embedded Architecture and Compilation. This is the name that we have since the very beginning in 2004. And our mission is to advance computing systems research and development as a discipline in Europe. And we want to do this by closing the gap between industry and academia, because the gap between industry and academia is wider in Europe than it is in the US, so we want to change that. And also we want to bring together the hardware and software communities uh, in one network so that they can interact with each other and learn from each other. Um, so what is the HIPE community? So we are academics and industry people working together and in general we are trying to work on efficient computing systems from deep edge to supercomputers so because it's the same enabling technology which is used for all these uh, computing systems. Huh? Uh, so think about microprocessors, microcontrollers, uh, accelerators, uh, also ECUs that you find in cars, IoT systems, but also the tools to program them or to use them to compile as the operating systems, the middleware. So this is another representation. So we have all these items. You also see there EPI. This is the European Processor Initiative. And many of the members of HIPEAC are also involved in that uh, effort. But we do not focus on the underlying technology, the CMOS technology, and we do not deal with applica the application layer on top of it. We have members who are active in that area, but this is not the focus of the HIPEAC uh, network itself. We have four objectives. Um, the first objective is to secure and to strengthen a leading position in Europe uh, in computing systems. Um, by advancing computing systems as a discipline. So that's what we want to do. Europe is not the strongest continent, I would say, in, in, in this area, but we really want to change that. We have been trying to do that for the last uh, 17 years. We also want to prepare the next generation of world-class computing system scientists and uh, engineers. So this is the next generation. We want to integrate uh, young people in our network and lead them towards the companies and the research institutes that will develop the systems of the future. We want to build a dynamic uh, ecosystem um, by bringing together all the important uh, players uh, from industry, but also from uh, research, from universities, SMEs, startup, startup companies, spin-off companies, and also important, the policy makers, which are, um, well, the politicians, but also, of course, the funding agencies that uh, support uh, the research in this area. And finally, we want to align research efforts in computing uh, systems and strengthen the research impact in Europe um, by identifying long-term challenges uh, uh, and then to put them into recommendations that go to the policy makers, to companies, to uh, universities, uh, etc. 
So how big are we? We, we have at this moment around 800 members. These are members that have been accepted by the steering committee of High Peak. Uh, but they can then also affiliate their colleagues, their students. Uh, and if we add together the whole, um, all the members that we have, so the affiliate members and the real, the, the official members, we have a network of around 2,500 uh, people who are all experts in computing systems and based mostly in the uh, European Union. So this covers almost 500 institutions in 50 countries. So we go a little bit beyond the EU 27, the 27 countries of the Un uh, European Union, um, but the majority of the members are from um, within the Union. And our membership is free of uh, charge. Where do our members come from? Well, here you see a distribution over the different countries. So the biggest group is coming from the larger countries. So you have the United Kingdom, you have Spain, Germany, Italy, France. These are the big con uh, countries. They contribute uh, most. And then we have the long tail <clears throat> with uh, countries like uh, Albania, Latvia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, etc. These are small countries. They do not have a very strong um, computing industry or computing research tradition. But nevertheless, we try to also integrate them in our network because we want them to catch up with the rest of uh, Europe, mostly in uh, Western uh, Europe. This is the evolution of the number of members. So you see that there is a steady increase of number of members uh, up to the 800 that we currently have. We do not actively scout for members. Um, researchers find us, they apply for membership. That is how we are growing. Um, the second line here is the, the blue line is the um, industry partners or members. So you see that about one third of our members are coming from industry and they are growing uh, proportionally with the total number of uh, members. We also have other lines on female members, uh, members from new member states. These are the former Eastern European countries, but all these lines are uh, going up. We also revoke membership. Um, so membership is for free, but partners have to contribute. So they either have to attend events or they have to contribute on social media or write an article for the magazine, contribute to the roadmap, whatever it is, but they have to be active. If they are not active for two years, we ask them to either become active or to leave the network. So, and here you see that on average between around 15, 20 uh, members per year are asked to leave the network. Hmm? It is a project, so it has work packages, uh, and here you see them. Uh, so we start with community building and, and networking, and then uh, we have uh, communication and talent management, and finally we go for the, um, for the road mapping. So I will briefly introduce the different activities that we have and how these activities help and contribute to the community building that we want to do and closing the gap. So you will see that we have different target groups into the network and we try to create activities for the different target groups of our membership. <clears throat> so let's start with the conference. Uh, the conference is today, I think, the second biggest um, computing systems conference in Europe after the DATE conference um, as a genuine European conference that stays within uh, Europe. Um, the last in-person conference took place in 2020 in, in Bologna, and here you have a view of uh, the conference. So um, many years ago, we were a regular research conference. So we had a call for papers, um, uh, program committee, etc. And then we had two days of workshops during the weekend, and then three days of the main technical program of the conference, and that was it, five days in total. In 2012, we and we attracted something like 150, between 150 and 200 participants per conference. In 2012, we decided to change that, and so we uh, compressed the conference into three days. So we ran the workshops and the tutorials in parallel with the technical program, uh, the main uh, track of the, of the conference. And immediately we had not uh, 200, but we got more than 500 uh, participants. And since then, this had stayed at that level between five and 600. In 2021, we got almost 900, but that was a virtual conference, so the threshold to participate uh, was lower. You see here that we have a huge number of uh, workshops, um, um, between 25 and 30 workshops. 
Um, and these workshops are organized by the community. So members um, sit together, they propose a workshop uh, proposal, and then they organize it in the context uh, of the conference. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, we have an increasing number of tutorials. Um, the paper track is, um, is a general first uh, mechanism that we use there. So in order to get the presentation at the conference, you first have to submit your paper to a journal. It's the ACM TACO journal. And all the papers that are accepted, the original work papers that are accepted by the um, ACM TACO journal, uh, the authors get an invitation to present their work at the conference. And so you, you can here see that we have on average between 40 and 50 papers per year that uh, we um, get an invitation and the majority of them, pre-COVID times, they decide to come to the conference and give a presentation to disseminate their work. You can also see that the sponsorship is going up, uh, 51,000 euro in 2020, and the number of booths um, which are um, hired by companies, I would say, is also increasing. And also the participation by industry is increasing. So we increasingly also succeed in attracting industry um, into uh, the network. Uh, what do we do at the conference? We also have professional camera uh, crew and journalists, so they come and interview the people at, at the conference. Uh, we have officials from the uh, European Commission coming uh, to explain the, um, the policy of the European Commission in, our, in the domain of High Peak, and also they come and explain about the upcoming calls where the community can uh, submit proposals uh, to. Um, but, well, with COVID, we had to do this in a um, virtual way, and also we took this as an opportunity to learn how to deal with virtual meetings. And here you see, actually, um, we can measure everything that people do in a, in a virtual conference. And here you see we have more than 40 activities. Um, and you see here, this graph horizontally is the number of activities that people attend at the conference. And vertically are the number of people uh, in that, with that number of activities participated in. You see that 200 people out of the 900 did not participate at all. These were real no-shows. They did not attend any activity at the conference. And then we got 140 that just went to one single activity. Probably they had a paper in one of the workshops. Um, and they only attended the workshop they were presenting in. And then 100 uh, did two activities, maybe a, key, a keynote and a workshop, and then 80 did uh, three and so on. What we see here that of the 700 people who did something with the conference, 50% uh, uh, of that um, did not attend more than four activities of the conference, which is way less than what we had at a physical conference because there while you're at a conference, you normally go to workshops, tutorials, uh, to all the activities that are taking place. Eh? But there's even more. If you look at how the people who attend um, an event, how they participate, here you see these are the number of people, well, uh, more than 390. These are the people who, showed, who registered for the keynote. Eventually, you see that only 260, uh, 235 or so people showed up. Uh, that's... 60% or so, and then not everybody showed up at the beginning. So because here you can see, uh, this is the time when people showed up. Uh, so some people just waited for 10, 15 minutes before they uh, dialed in. And some people left sooner than the end of the session. Hmm? So the people who were reeling uh, in the keynote from the beginning to the end is about 150. Hmm? All the others arrived late or left uh, sooner. Hmm? For the keynote, that's not too bad, but if you look at a workshop, here you have an example of a workshop. Here you see that, uh, well, of the 235 people who uh, registered for the workshop, uh, only 100 showed up, and the majority of them showed up for a very short time. And so the only ones that stayed during the whole workshop were maybe 10 people, and half of them were probably the organizers of the events. How come? Well, you see here that this uh, workshop uh, took 400 minutes, 400 minutes is a long time, so that's more than six hours. So in a virtual event, it doesn't make sense to organize very long uh, events. So we uh, have learned from this, and now we promote more events like one hour, one hour and a half, if they are virtual uh, events. Another thing we do is the uh, summer school, the yearly summer school. Um, it takes place in Italy in the summer. And this is a full week, um, and we have 12 courses being taught from Monday to Friday, uh, every day a lecture. 
And there are four slots per day, two morning slots and two afternoon slots. And per slot, people can choose one course out of three. So here you have the first slot, uh, for instance, um, here in this first column. And the second slot, you have uh, three other courses. And people pick one per slot, and then they, stick, uh, they stay with that course uh, for the rest of the week. So they take the same course with five uh, lectures uh, per week. This is one of the... Um, most appreciated events. Um, so it's mostly uh, attended by PhD students, uh, European PhD students, but also from outside Europe. Um, and it's a one week event. And it's not only that they learn more about state of the art technology um, and entrepreneurship too, but also that they have an opportunity to network. So there's also a poster session. So the, the, um, the participants know also about the research of the other participants, the fellow PhD students. And then after one week, uh, they go back home and they have a small network of 20, 25, 30 people already to start their career. So that's an activity that is mostly dedicated to the junior profiles, junior members in our network. But also senior members are welcome. I have been there uh, for many years uh, already. It's a very enjoyable uh, activity. Then we have um, networking uh, events. We have two, one in spring and one in summer. This is also a bottom-up event where our members can organize um, what we call thematic sessions on a particular topic. Uh, we provide them with space um, and, and the catering and everything, and they can organize it. It takes two, or it's called a week, but it's more like two, three days. Um, we're uh, completely packed with workshops and tutorials and, and keynotes. Uh, where the people meet and interact and, and network. So that's what we have in spring and in autumn. We also had to do it uh, in a uh, virtual way recently. And these are the numbers here. You see the red bars are the number of people registering for one of the events. So you have 14 events in this um, computing system week. Uh, but you see that the attendance is much lower. It's like one third. And then even the ones that uh, attend, maybe do not attend for the whole duration. So there is nothing that matches a real physical event. That's something we learned from uh, this COVID um, experience. Here you see an example of one of the events. So 101 people registered. Eventually 35, I think, uh, dialed in and then of the 35, only 12 or so were there the whole time. Um, and two or three are probably the organizers. So that's the reality. But if we um, think about it, if we are in a conference, we are often in a workshop, in an event, but often reading email uh, or using social media or doing other stuff. So maybe we are not listening. Here we are really uh, looking at people. So the ones that stayed there for the whole duration, they were probably also actively involved in what was going on. Hmm? So that's... Um, it might be shocking to some people, but I'm afraid this is just reality. Okay, so this uh, summarizes actually what we do for community building and for networking. And now I would like to move to the second one, is the communication and talent management, where we also have a set of activities that are very important. So the first one is actually um, in communications, is the branding and the corporate image that we try to create. So in 2014, I think it was, um, we hired for the very first time a full-time communications officer in Hypeq. And that helped us a lot because this made our messages much more concise, much more targeted to particular target groups, etc. And so um, we now have a, a, a corporate style, I would say, um, which is respected all over all the communications uh, that we are doing. Uh, and all the events that we are organizing are using, organizing are using this uh, style. Of course, we had to move to more digital um, assets uh, due to COVID, but that was not a problem with our communications uh, since we had professional people that knew exactly how to do this. Yeah? So in our communications, we also have, still have printed communications. We have a magazine. Um, we also still print the roadmap, the high peak vision is still uh, printed. And when we communicate um, 
in print, I would say, but also in social media. We focus on particular topics too. So this is, for instance, an example of cyber physical systems. This is one of the focal areas of Hypix 6. And then you see that we have interviews, we have articles, uh, we have um, C-level people of companies explaining uh, about uh, cyber physical systems, uh, etc. We have uh, social media that we use to support uh, these messages. So this is um, one example. Another highlight is that we want to promote underrepresented groups, uh, colleagues from new member states, from the former Eastern European uh, countries. Uh, but also, for instance, entrepreneurs, uh, people starting startup companies, spin-off companies, also female colleagues. So here we have an example of a number of female colleagues that we promote here as role models uh, for female, uh, junior female uh, members uh, on what they can reach in their uh, career. We also have a little bit of mentoring on, in some, uh, on some occasions, like the summer school. Um, the female teachers are also mentoring the female participants. So this is something we do uh, to uh, promote the underrepresented groups. We also have the um, top level people that we have in our network, the, 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 the star researchers. Um, so um, their courses, their keynotes are being shared on what we call the High Peak TV, which is the YouTube channel. Um, and here you have a number of examples. Also, of course, we promote also the High Peak uh, Vision, which is our roadmap document. It's also heavily promoted um, uh, by the uh, communications uh, that we are doing. We have even created a, a comic book on some of the topics to reach out to uh, society. Um, and of course, here, for instance, you see that um, one of the, co the members is very, was very active in high-performance computing in the race against the, the coronavirus. So it's important for us to put this also, to put the spotlights on this kind of uh, results of our community. Obviously, we also have social media, uh, and uh, we have a Twitter a channel, um, and this is growing steadily over time. Um, the fact that we have a dedicated communications officer helps in order to manage and to operate the um, uh, Twitter channel, because you have to do this at a daily basis, you have to retweet, you have to react to messages and so on. And so the fact that we have somebody to do this um, makes sure that it happens, actually. Um, what we learn is the number of followers only increases, or mostly increases, during uh, events. So if you have events, you have a peak in new uh, followers. Um, in COVID times, we did not have physical events, so that was more difficult. We also have a LinkedIn channel. Um, we use this also to promote the activities, but also to promote jobs, because that's an, a platform which is uh, very important uh, to promote uh, jobs. And you see here, we have more than 2,000 followers also on uh, LinkedIn, which is uh, very nice. <coughs> Um, we also, uh, well, these are activities that we do internally. We also reach out and we call it the roadshow. So we go to events organized by sister organizations and we have a presence there. So we have booths uh, with some of our uh, staff members or partners of the network. Um, and we try to make it an attractive place for people to gather, the hyper community also together and to meet each other at other conferences. This is an example of a virtual booth that we had at the FX conference, which is organized by a number of associations also in the computing domain in, in, in Europe. I already mentioned the Hypeak Jobs Portal, uh, which is a very important uh, tool that we offer. <clears throat> Every Hypeak member and even non-Hypeak members in Europe, they can post open positions at the jobs website. And this helps the whole community. So it helps the universities <clears throat> because if they're looking for bright new PhD students, for um, uh, new professors, um, also for collaborators in EU projects, in European projects, you have to uh, publicize the open position of EU projects uh, in, in, in Europe globally. Um, so putting at this website already fulfills that uh, requirement. Uh, but also companies, especially the startup companies and the spin-off companies. For them, this website is a great help uh, because for they do have little resources to reach out or to find profiles somewhere in Europe they could benefit from. 
So because they are looking for specialized profiles in some cases. Um, and if there is somebody with that profile, uh, a company in Belgium that is looking somebody with a very specialized profile in Greece, normally you cannot reach them. But through Hypeek they can reach them because people with these profiles, they know the website, they go and look for jobs there. And if the company put their open positions there, they can find it. So this is very, um, this is really something we do for our uh, um, startup companies and for the spin-off companies. That's also of great value for them. Uh, the website is also used to promote internships in companies. So that's another be uh, added benefit from this website. At physical events that are organized, we also put the open positions on um, poster boards just to show how many open positions there are in, uh, in, in high peak and in the computing uh, industry in, um, in Europe. <coughs> This is the evolution of the numbers. So in 2015, we hired, or 14, we hired a recruitment officer. And together with the communications officer, we also rec uh, hired a recruitment officer whose job it was um, to run the High Peak Jobs website. And he was pretty successful. So you see that the number of open positions uh, went up, up to the level of 600, and then we somehow plateaued hmm, uh, over the last four years. But this year, all of a sudden, we saw it happening from the beginning of the year 2021. The number of uh, open positions was really exploding. And this year, we already have more than almost 800, and we might end up very close to 1,000, which is almost doubling the number <clears throat> that we got in the previous years. So we see that there's a real war for talent at this moment ongoing in the computing uh, disability in the high peak uh, community. Yeah. So this website only uh, carries uh, open jobs in Europe, not from outside Europe, but the website is open for the rest of the world. So this is also an, um, a tool that we are using to uh, attract talent uh, towards uh, Europe. Uh, we do not uh, carry open positions outside uh, Europe because this is being funded, uh, subsidized by the European Commission. So, uh, and they don't want us to do that. <clears throat> uh, that was for companies and for universities too. Um, and then we also have awards, but that's really for uh, universities, for university professors, postdoc, PhD students. So we also have high peak paper awards. Um, so in 2008, we started with these awards and the, um, <clears throat> we have a short list of um, what we call uh, high peak award conferences. These are uh, key conferences, important conferences in the high peak domain, like in computer architecture, compilation, etc. And uh, you see here that in 2008, we got something like 15 papers uh, from our members in, that, uh, in these uh, conferences. And then the years after, it, it went up. And today, we are between 60 and 70 papers. Of course, the community has grown over time, but also we, have, we are submitting more papers to these conferences. So we believe that um, the award of 1,000 euro per uh, accepted paper really uh, stimulated the community to submit more often to these conferences and to have to create a higher visibility, more visibility for the research which is done here in Europe in this uh, area. <clears throat> we have also tried to duplicate this success with uh, technology transfer. And we also created uh, a few years, uh, years later in 2012 Technology Transfer Award, so everybody, every member of Hypeak who uh, can prove that he did a success or he or she did a successful technology transfer of technology developed at university to a company or created a spin-off company, they can get a certificate and an award of 1,000 euro. We were hoping to have the same increase in number as we got for the paper awards, but that's not the case. So you see that here we hover around eight uh, technology transfers per year. It would not hurt if it would be five more, <laughs> more like 40 per year instead of eight per year. Eight on the total number of uh, members of 2,500 is really low. Hmm? Um, but that's something which is structural in Europe. Um, most European researchers are not uh, very entrepreneurial, especially the ones at universities. And so they don't care, to, not, they don't care enough about uh, innovation and monetization of their research. We hope that this will change in the, in the future. <clears throat> this brings me to the third work package, road mapping and impact analysis. Um, so this is actually the work we, we produce a, um, a document 
which is called the High Peak Vision, which is a road mapping document. So we started doing that in 2008. Here you can see. This was a real road map, as you can see from the cover. And then uh, in 2009, 2011, all the odd years, we created a road map. So it's a biannual uh, document. And over the years, we have learned how to do this. So in the first year, we just uh, brought together a number of people. We asked them what your, the future of your research area, your uh, narrow re research area. We compiled everything in one document, and that was the roadmap. Then we discovered, no, this is not good because not all the documents are, not all the areas are of equal importance. So we have to make choices. And from 2009 on, we started uh, making choices. So we have an editorial board, we collect all the information, and then we make choices. We define recommendations for the commission, for the politicians, etc. So that's what we have been doing since 2009. Uh, I think I can say that um, starting in 2011, uh, 2013, we really have now a solid process in order to build a community-based vision document. So we um, uh, consult the complete, the complete communities, the 800 members, and extended to 2,500 members. They can all actively contribute. Um, and then we bring all that information together. We invite them to have more information, etc. And eventually, we compile this into one document. It's something like 180 pages uh, every time with recommendations um, for different uh, target, uh, target groups. So currently, we are working on the uh, vision. Well, 2001 vision uh, was published this year. Now we're working on an update for 2022. And the next real new vision uh, will be published in 2023. What's the structure of the vision? Um, well, uh, there are a number of parts. So there are the recommendations, uh, the technical global policy recommendations, societal recommendations. I will list them uh, after the slide. And then we also. Um, consider four dimensions. So there's the first is the technical dimension. This is about how is technology going to um, evolve. Then there is the business dimension. What are the, um, the problems that businesses uh, see? Like today, there is a clear problem with the uh, supply chains um, for chips, etc. Um, then there is also the societal dimension. So what happens with society and what is the impact of technology on society? So we all know about cyber uh, security or the lack of cyber security, uh, political influence, hacking, etc. And then there's also the European dimension, which is mostly about, well, the strengths and weaknesses of Europe and also the values that we want to promote as, um, as Europeans. So internally, the document consists of a number of uh, opinion uh, articles, I, I would say. Um, so this is about the continuum of computing. So there's one on the, the Moonshot project, Guardian Angels, that we promote, propose, cyber physical systems um, from the application perspective. So we have articles, 40 in total written by experts from the network. So that's what they're doing. And then the editorial board compiles everything, um, takes all the, the, the recommendations at the article level and puts them together into uh, global recommendations for the complete uh, roadmap. So I will list the technical recommend the recommendations that we made in the 2021 uh, version. So the technical re recommendations can be summarized in one sentence from CPS to 5S CPS square. And the 5S stands for, well, five properties that modern computing systems should uh, have. They should be sober in energy consumption, so that's energy efficient. They should be secure, obviously, but also safe, uh, especially if you are a cyber, civil, uh, cyber physical system controlling um, objects in the real world. Um, they should be straightforward, which means that we should be able to deal with complexity. Uh, the complexity if it should be either simple enough for humans, and if it's too complex for humans, we should use computers to help the humans in order to deal with the complexity. Um, and then finally, it should be sustainable. The European Green Deal is a big deal in Europe, uh, so we have to think about the, um, uh, the use of materials uh, that we have in computer system, whether they can be recycled, how long they will last, etc. So that's sustainability. It's a very important uh, topic uh, nowadays in, in research, but also in companies, because companies understand if they, will, if they are not sustainable, they will not last for a very long time. 
because uh, Europe is really promoting the use of sustainable technology. Hmm? The CPS square stands for, well, CPS, cyber physical systems, we know that, but we added the C, a P, and an S. Uh, the C, one C from cognitive, so the system should be artificial intelligent, they should be smart, so that's, um, uh, that's normal. Cyber, that standard was already there. Predictive is another one, so we need also digital twins that can model the environment and also the system itself so that we can predict the, the behavior. And physical, and then instead of system, it's a system of systems, which means that the systems are distributed, um, interconnected, they work together, it's a con uh, computing continuum from the edge uh, to the cloud to the supercomputer, so everything is one, uh, one continuum system of systems. So we believe that these are the properties of the future um, uh, systems that we will uh, build uh, and that will be uh, successful in the, in, in the future. Now for the policy recommendations, we advise the European Commission to invest more in open source software and hardware. As you know, the, um, open, the Eclipse Foundation moved to Europe. Also, Risk Five is very important in Europe at this moment. We should continue to investigate in emerging technologies uh, uh, at CMOS level, but also quantum computing, uh, neuromorphic, um, etc. So we should not forget about this. This might replace at some point the standard technology that we have today. And also, we advocate for a moonshot project, uh, Guardian Angel, which is actually a kind of personal assistant, but one that is more loyal to the user than to the company that produces that produced the, uh, the um, assistant. And then at the level of the societal recommendations, that for the politicians, I would say, is um, uh, maybe we should create some international competence centers. CERN has, its, has one for particle physics, but it would be good to have one also, a European one, for computing systems. Uh, one that drives the research agenda and also attracts talent from all over Europe and, and beyond. Um, there's also a solid European digital infrastructure, uh, broadband, uh, 5G, things like that. Training, we lack m hundreds of thousands, more than a million of IT work, so we should work on that by training, by, uh, by retraining them, lifelong learning. Um, we should also um, encourage an innovation culture in Europe. We don't have enough entrepreneurs. We should really work on that uh, from the primary school, secondary school, university uh, on. And then also we want to uh, keep focusing on European values and digital ethics, which is also very important. We believe that Europe is there on the middle ground between the US and, and, and China. Hmm? This brings me to the last work package, which is the least uh, important one. Um, so we have four uh, permanent staff members running the network, actually. Here you see them. And of the total budget per year, as you can see here, 50% is allocated to the um, uh, activities that we are doing, so the conference, the summer school, etc. 25% uh, is allocated to the staff, and only 25% is allocated to the partners of the network. So the partners get very little money, around the 1,000 euro per month, just to attend the meetings. But the real work is done by the staff, which is located in only two sites. And the majority, 50% of the budget goes to activities, uh, which are also paid by uh, the, the network. Our budget now is around 1 million euro per year. So half a million goes to the activities, a quarter million to the staff, and a quarter million to the uh, partners. And that has been like this for 17 years. Now, to conclude, what is the impact of High Peak? Uh, well, I believe, uh, and I think it's fair to say, that High Peak has created a strong European brand in computing, um, that we have created an identity for the computing community in Europe, so people identify with High Peak, and they are proud to be a High Peak member, that we are working with different target groups, and that we are inclusive. Uh, projects, uh, communities, hardware, software, but also new member states, female uh, participants, PhD students, etc. We have something for all these people. We take care of all of them. We also stimulate job mobility and talent management within the high peak uh, members. So we have created a bit of brain gain in the past. So there have been some top profiles from uh, other uh, um, uh, continents coming to Europe. Uh, we hope thanks to high peak. And, we, and because once they are coming to Europe, they can be integrated in the European ecosystem within a year. So they just show up at a, par, a, com, a couple of meetings, they do one or two keynotes, and everybody knows that they are here and they can start collaborating. And we attract young talent to the community, and we also create a vision for the future. That's our roadmap work. 
Now, finally, what are the lessons learned? Which mistakes would I not make if we would have to start again from, from scratch? Well, creating a brand and a network takes time and effort. You cannot do it in one year, you need years. I think it took us eight to 10 years in order to create a network of more than 1,000 people. So it takes time. Um, you need to have the right activities to attract mem members and to keep them. That's also a very important uh, item. Loyal members are very important. Uh, people who really like your network and are willing to contribute and to, um, to add value. A network also needs to evolve. If you do not move, if, you, if there's a standstill, you lose, eh? you will disappear. So you have to constantly, constantly reinvent yourself. It's like a company that has to compete uh, with the competition. And a network, running a network requires uh, professional staff. Without staff, um, this is not uh, possible. You need to have enough resources. And finally, a network like Hypeak cannot survive without public or private funding. It's not possible. If we would uh, have to live from uh, membership fees, we would have 100,000 euro, not 1 million. And we would not be able to do what we are doing today. This was my uh, presentation on High Peak. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I'd be available to answer questions after this presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Colin, for, the, for that talk. We do have a few minutes for some questions, and there, there have been a few questions coming in. Uh, the first one uh, is, uh, are you there? He's there, okay. <laughs> I can't see you. Um, the first question is, uh, how will uh, or how has uh, Brexit affected uh, High Peak? Um, well, it has affected us because we have been worried about it, I would say. Um, in practice, it hasn't changed a lot so far because all the running projects just continue. And apparently, the partner from the UK can still uh, participate in EU uh, research projects at this moment. So for us, the impact is not the, um, very high, not at research level. It has made travel in Europe a bit more difficult for, uh, for the partner from the e, uh, UK. But that was also the case in the past because um, people who got the visa to work in UK did not have automatically uh, um, uh, a visa to travel in Europe, a Schengen visa. So, yeah. Um, but it is a pity for the research community that they do no longer belong to the EU uh, 27 or 28. Yeah. Another question is about your requirement to have an H index of 10 plus uh, for academics to become a member. Uh, can, you, um, can you talk about that a little bit more? It seems counterintuitive uh, to have that requirement. Um, yes, well, that's something we have created just to have some kind of thresholds for the uh, official members we want that are accepted by the steering committee. This requirement does not hold for all the affiliates, not for PhD students, not for postdocs, not for colleagues. Uh, we only do this for um, the official members, the 800. But I must also say that if one steering committee member uh, votes in favor member, even if the H index is lower, we accept that member. So nobody who wants to be active is ever excluded from the network. Okay, thank you. We have, uh, we'll have time for one more question. It comes from Vivek uh, Sarkar from Georgia Tech. He asks, uh, what tension have you seen by excluding applications from HIPEC's scope? That is, uh, is there a need for HIPEC researchers uh, to work with uh, machine learning application researchers? No, there's not. I think we are open. Um, there is a difference between what we are doing or what we are focusing uh, on as a project. So we are a European project. We respond to calls where we submit a proposal. Um, and that's our focus. But at the membership level, our members can do whatever they want. And we have several members who are very active in machine learning. And they are organizing workshops. That's not a problem. But as a network uh, itself, with the activities that we are doing, we will not directly focus on these. But that has to do with the call where we respond to. Okay, thank you. I, I think we're out of time. I'd like to thank both of our speakers for enjoyable talks uh, this morning. Thank you.
Usually, in conclusion, let me just uh, mention that uh, this afternoon there's uh, another set of um, invited uh, speakers that will be here in this room. I, I, can't, I don't have in front of me the exact names, but, uh, but please come back and join us for the invited, invited talks this afternoon. Have a good lunch. We'll see you later.